Welcome, welcome everyone uh, that uh, connected for this day's lecture. Uh, this, uh, today's lecture will be about crystallization and uh, in particular about understanding the synthesis of crystalline materials from molecules to industrial crystallizers. My name is Matteo Salvalaglio. I am a lecturer at UCL Chemical Engineering and I lead the Molecular Modeling and Engineering Group. Uh, my research is in uh, uh, molecular modeling and I'm interested in using molecular modeling to understand uh, molecular systems and uh, how molecular systems transform within uh, processes that are of interest for, the, for, for uh, chemical engineering applications. And uh, one of the interests that we have is in crystallization. And, uh, and so in this presentation, you'll see several, uh, several uh, um, images and results and uh, uh, resources that come directly from our research. So let, the, let me jump into, into uh, the lecture. Uh, so to, to start, I'd like to outline what are the learning outcomes for this half an hour discussion. And uh, uh, the learning outcomes are essentially being able to answer a few uh, qualitative uh, questions about crystallization, and uh, in particular about uh, uh, some important aspects that are fundamental to understanding crystallization in a, a chemical engineering context. So first of all, we, we start from the very basics. What is crystallization? How can we understand crystallization uh, as a chemical uh, physical transformation involving molecules? Then we'll try to answer questions about why and how crystals assemble and grow. And then uh, we will highlight a couple of uh, important technological aspects of crystal growth that are related to what uh, the crystal structure uh, is and uh, how crystals appear in terms of uh, particle shape. And uh, the first question that we will try to, to answer is what is polymorphism? Uh, which relates to the crystal structures and, uh, and uh, how molecules assemble in the solid phase. And the second is what are crystal habits. At the end of these four, four uh, overview questions on the fundamental of crystallizations, we will try to outline what is the role of chemical engineers in all this. And uh, throughout my presentation, I'd like to encourage you to ask questions. I think you should have access to a Q&A &A, uh, &A facility on the sharing program, and I'm sure you can you can use that to post your questions at the end. After after going through uh, the slides, I'll, I'll try to answer as many as many as possible. So let me jump into the first question: What is crystallization? So when we think at crystallization, basically we think at a process uh, that starts from molecules. We have molecules in a, in a certain environment, which could be a liquid phase or a gas phase, and those molecules assemble to produce materials. Those materials have a characteristic bulk structure, so it means that uh, their bulk is uh, actually organized in a very precise manner. Uh, those materials are characterized by a certain particle morphology, and with these two aspects, so bulk structure and particle morphology, comes, uh, uh, comes surface properties. So basically, they, the surface they exhibit uh, that, that, uh, to, to the environment uh, has specific properties. So the process of going from molecules to crystalline materials involves a phase transition. What does it mean? Well, it means that uh, those molecules uh, will pass from a phase, which is co usually called the parent phase, uh, and uh, uh, transform and assemble into a new phase, which is crystalline in nature. This process actually takes place in usually in two steps. The first step is called nucleation. A nucleation is the birth or the emergence of the first embryo of a crystalline phase uh, from a parent phase. Uh, the second step of this process is called growth. And growth is the process of uh, uh, expansion of this new uh, crystalline phase that happens uh, via the addition of molecules uh, to this new, newly formed crystalline embryo. Now, it's interesting to note that in this process from molecules to materials, we are bridging lots of, of uh, lots of length scales. So we start from the length scale of molecules, so angstrom to nanometers, nanometers, and then we bridge up to uh, macroscopic sizes. So crystals that uh, are well within uh, the uh, observable range uh, with your naked eye. So these processes uh, 
are responsible for essentially producing materials that carry with them uh, properties that are the properties of the molecules themselves, but also emergent properties that are related to their assembly. And uh, there's many applications for crystallization processes. For example, uh, crystallization processes are uh, in an industrial context uh, are uh, uh, used to produce, uh, uh, to, to carry out energy efficient separations because this, uh, this process of assembly leads to, to high pure, high phases that are highly pure. And then uh, they're also used to produce high value chemicals, such as, for example, pharmaceutical compounds and also functional materials. So to go a little bit deeper into the, this idea of uh, how crystalline materials uh, bridge scales, uh, actually I'd like to highlight how an inherent and important property of crystalline materials is that uh, they're ordered and their order actually develops from the molecular scale but reaches up to the macroscopic scale. So what you're, what you're going to see uh, in this slide are two short movies. Uh, shows a tiny uh, crystal of an ACL, sodium chloride, that is growing. And uh, the, the length scale of this process is 10 to the nine uh, meters, 10 to the minus nine meters. So it's, it's a nanometer scale. And uh, so this is an extremely tiny object that floats in solution, floats in water and grows in size. Now this process, as you can see, leads to the formation of a very uh, ordered uh, phase a very ordered cluster that has a characteristic uh, that it's evolving towards a characteristic cubical shape. Now on the right here, you see an actual crystal in the micrometer uh, length scale that is observed via, via an optical microscope. Here you have a reconstruction of its, uh, of its uh, shape and you see that uh, this crystal uh, grows and evolves into a cubic uh, particle. So the point that I want to make is that the order that is characteristic of the molecular scale that you see developing on the left is actually responsible for the emergence of a very ordered macroscopic phase, which is ordered at a scale that is actually accessible uh, to our uh, own uh, senses. So this is an important property of molecular material, all of uh, uh, crystalline materials. And in particular, uh, this also relates to our uh, intuitive understanding of what a crystal is. So usually when we think of crystals, we think uh, at faceted particles. So particles that have a geometric shape that has very well-defined facets. And uh, uh, in contrast, uh, materials that do not possess that uh, uh, local molecular level order are actually amorphous. And those are usually, uh, are usually represented, are usually emerging as uh, very isotropic uh, uh, particles, as you can see here on the bottom. So first of all, uh, another question that we want to try and, and, and briefly address is why a crystal should assemble and grow. And uh, to understand this question, it's important to uh, relate to actually what the um, relationship between crystal growth and solubility is. And uh, uh, to understand that, we will refer to a system that uh, grows, a crystal that grows in a solution. A solution, as you see up left, is a liquid phase with at least two components. And for the sake of simplicity, we should call the solvent A and the solute B. And solubility is the concentration of the solute B in conditions of thermodynamic equilibrium between the solution and the crystal that is formed. Uh, what does it mean? It means that if we look at uh, uh, on the right at this scheme, where we have temperature on the x-axis and the concentration of B, so the concentration of solute on the y-axis, well, all the points that lie on this uh, red curve that is characterized by x equals x star, where this x is the uh, concentration of the solute B and x star is its value at equilibrium, well, all these points uh, represent uh, uh, states in which the solution that contains B uh, is in equilibrium with the crystal. Now, if the concentration X is smaller than the concentration at equilibrium, uh, we are looking at an undersaturated solution. So a solution that is inherently stable and will not lead to the formation of any, of any crystal. Conversely, if we look at systems in which uh, uh, we have a concentration X larger than the equilibrium concentration X star, well, uh, we are talking about a supersaturated solution. 
Uh, when I'm talking about uh, saturation, I'm talking about a variable that uh, uh, represents the ratio between x and x star. So on the curve, on the red curve, on the solubility curve, that variable by definition is one because x equals x star. Uh, underneath the curve in the, in the blue uh, semiplane, uh, s is uh, smaller than one because x is smaller than x star. And above that, uh, that curve, above the red curve in the orange uh, plane, you have that S is larger than one. Now, uh, in this region, crystallization is thermodynamically favored. In this, in this region, instead, this solution is thermodynamically favored. So this means that if we, put a, if we prepare a solution at a concentration that uh, is larger than the, the equilibrium concentration, which I note it's also a function of temperature. So if you, if you change the temperature, you will have a different equilibrium concentration. Well, in those conditions, we will see the emergence of a crystalline phase. So uh, this process of emergence of a crystalline phase is uh, the process of nucleation. And again, to discuss nucleation, I'd like to show you a, a movie that comes from molecular simulations. And uh, in this particular movie, you are seeing a trajectory of a solution that contains urea molecules. And this is, a, uh, is an aqueous solution. The solvent is not really shown, but it's a solution that is prepared, as, as you can see in the diagram on, on the upper left, it's prepared in supersaturated conditions. So it's prepared at a concentration that is larger than the solubility for that compound at that particular temperature. So you see that uh, the spontaneous evolution of the system, it, it goes towards the formation of a, of a dense phase that is not just dense, but you can sort of outline with your own uh, pattern recognition uh, uh, skills, uh, you, can, you can see how uh, it is locally ordered. So the nucleation process is a collective self-assembly process that leads to the formation of the first embryo of a crystalline phase. And nucleation is actually uh, key to determining the bulk structure of crystals. And by bulk structure of crystals, I'm just uh, showing here a few, a few snapshots of that, uh, of that cluster that you saw emerging from solution. And you can see that uh, the in inner structure of, uh, of that cluster can actually change. It's not, it's not always the same. Now, uh, this introduces the other concept, the other idea that, uh, that I wanted to, to highlight. Uh, one of the two key ideas that I wanted to highlight concerning uh, crystals, which is polymorphism. So the bulk structure of crystals, uh, you know, given a certain molecule, can, can differ. So essentially the same molecule can assemble in crystals that have different structures. So um, in material science, to be more accurate, it refers to the possibility of a solid material to exist in more than one crystal structure. So it's, a, it's a, uh, referring to systems that are, from a chemical point of view, uh, completely identical in the sense that the molecules that make up those crystals are exactly the same, but the crystals themselves are arranged differently. And on the left here, you can see that that difference can be quite striking. Uh, here you have uh, uh, two different uh, crystals, two different types of crystals of glycine. Uh, one uh, form is called alpha, and it, it has this bulky, bulky shape that you can see indicated by this uh, orange arrow. And uh, the, other, the other crystals are instead uh, uh, characteristics of, characteristic of the beta form, a different uh, uh, packing of, uh, of glycine that is characterized by these elongated uh, structures. An important point is that the spatial arrangement of molecules, so the polymorph that molecules are actually crystallizing in, has a crucial impact on physical, chemical, and functional properties of crystalline materials. So for example, it affects the solubility, so it will affect the position of that red line that we saw uh, a couple of minutes ago. Uh, it will affect the dissolution rate, so for example, it will affect uh, the rate at which a crystal dissolves, uh, it will affect the melting point, optical properties, compaction behavior, and many more. There are a few examples that, that are actually important for technological applications. For example, you can take crystals that are exactly the same from a chemical point of view, but they're arranged differently, and they will have uh, dr drastically different catalytic properties. And uh, also, uh, most notably, for example, in the pharmaceutical uh, domain, 
uh, when crystals are arranged into different uh, into different uh, polymorph, well, the properties of the polymorph change radically, and that uh, can actually lead to to economic disasters, such as the uh, recalling of important uh, drugs. And uh, for example, if you, if you want to know more and Google the uh, ritonavir, it's it's an important uh, test case. So. Uh, in, in our research, for example, predicting the polymorphism is very important. Uh, and we use computational methods to do this and uh, in, in collaboration with other groups at UCL, in particular at chemistry. And uh, this is just a qualitative pictures that, uh, picture that I want to, to show you, just to highlight how a simple molecule like urea, which is not very complicated, it's not very large, does not have many functional groups. Well, even a molecule like this, from a computational perspective, it's a challenge because it can assemble in a wide range of, of different uh, of different uh, structures. And uh, here I'm showing a collection of these structures that are represented on this plane where uh, the variable on the x-axis is the density of the crystal packing and uh, the variable on the y-axis it's, uh, it's its potential energy, it's a measure of its stability. And it's just, uh, I mean, the point of this, of this uh, figure is just to show how the same molecule that's, that's appearing in all, in all these uh, little round uh, snapshots around this diagram actually uh, can pack in radically different, uh, radically different uh, uh, organizations and radically different structures. So trying to predict uh, how many of these structures will, we will be able to observe experimentally and produce and, and exploit from a technological perspective, it's extremely important. The second process that I wanted to discuss is growth. Uh, so growth comes when a crystal is formed. So we have, we have a particle that has a crystalline shape uh, there's a crystalline structure, and it's actually associated with uh, the incorporation of growth units, so in this case of molecules, into its, uh, into its uh, structure and the evolution towards macroscopic, uh, macroscopically observable uh, particles. So once again, uh, growth will happen uh, when the system is supersaturated, so when the, sup when the concentration is larger than the equilibrium concentration uh, for a certain process, for a certain system, and uh, uh, growth, uh, it's, it's another interesting process in the sense that it's another inherently multi-scale process uh, because it affects objects that are macroscopically observable in this, uh, in this uh, figure, in this uh, uh, optical microscope image that you see uh, on the left, uh, you see a particle, a crystalline particle uh, that is, again, it's a particle of urea. Uh, the growth of this particle will happen uh, differently on different faces uh, of this crystal. So we can, we can simplify the structure of this particle, of this, of this crystalline particle, as uh, the structure of, of a polyhedron that has two types of faces, blue and red faces. Well, those uh, red faces and those blue faces will have a, an inherently different structure at the molecular level. So this means that molecules that are, are exposed to a solution on these blue and red faces will actually be in contact, uh, will actually expose very different functional groups and will react differently uh, with the environment. This means that uh, growth is, uh, is very much phase uh, dependent. And, uh, uh, it's, it's a, again, uh, it's a process that is affected by features that emerge at the molecular scale, again, at the nanometer scale, but have in, has impact on uh, objects that are observable at the, at the macroscopic scale. And uh, again, we can use a computational microscope to look at, this, at the, uh, to look at these processes. And here on the left, uh, I'm showing a simplified representation of, of a, a red uh, surface of urea that grows in supersaturated condition. In this representation, uh, urea molecules are, are uh, I mean, the simulation is solved by considering the full atomistic structure of urea molecules. However, those molecules are represented as spheres for the sake of, of representation. And once again, the solvent is not shown in this, in this uh, short movie. But you can appreciate that uh, uh, the crystal is growing from its initial structure. You see that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's propagating in space. The crystal in front is propagating in space. It's not only propagating in space, it's propagating in an ordered manner. So you see that there's a color code going on in, the, in, this, in this movie, and uh, uh, the blue spheres uh, uh, represent uh, ordered urea molecules, so molecules that are uh, assembled according to the characteristic order of, of the particular crystal structure of urea that we are considering in this simulation, and uh, the red molecules instead are disordered. It means that they're surrounded by molecules that are completely randomly packed. 
So you see that uh, th this growth process uh, proceeds through, through the propagation of, of, uh, of, uh, of this density front. And uh, uh, there are several potential uh, growth mechanisms uh, that, uh, that emerge and that lead to crystal growth. Uh, here, there's lots of information in this slide. I just want to point out something uh, that uh, basically relates to the fact that uh, growth happens when we have uh, de defects on the surface. And there are two big families, two uh, large families of growth mechanisms, uh, diffusion limited or, surf or surface integration limited. I want you to focus only on the surface integration limited for a second. And, uh, and I want you to realize that uh, those uh, surface integration processes are actually uh, associated to features that emerge on the surface of, of, the, of the faces of crystals, such as, for example, you see this birth and spread type of mechanism is characterized by the formation of these islands on the surface of crystals, while uh, the uh, growth through uh, the propagation of a spiral uh, of a spiral, that is the propagation of a surface defect, actually uh, is associated with the emergence of these uh, spirals on, on the surface of crystals. Now, I want to point out that uh, I, uh, the reason why I wanted to include this information is that I find remarkable the fact that uh, these mechanisms are very much related to what happens at the molecular scale, what, happen what happens at the scale of the constitutive particles that make up the crystals. However, uh, those features are emerging in a, widely, uh, in a wide range of different systems with very different, uh, uh, very different characteristics and properties and so on. For example, you can see features characteristic of birth and spread and spiral growth mechanisms in inorganic materials. Uh, as you can see lower left, where you have uh, the ASO4 uh, crystals uh, that shows birth and spread features and spiral growth uh, features as well on different faces. And then you have organic systems uh, that show this type of features. Again, you have an example for a, from a urea uh, and, and one from a cysteine crystal that, that grows with these nice uh, hexagonally shaped uh, uh, spirals. And then you have examples that come from hugely uh, complicated crystals that are protein crystals. Uh, so again, you see uh, taumatin growing with a birth and spread type of mechanism and cannabalin, which is another protein growing uh, following a spiral growth. So it is remarkable how the molecular scale is very, is, very, uh, is very important and determines the evolution of these systems. However, there, are some gen there is some generality in, this, in these ideas that transfer through systems that are extremely different. An important point, uh, an important point uh, associated to crystal uh, growth is that, uh, uh, as, you, as you understand, these, uh, the growth depends on the features that emerge, uh, on the molecular features that emerge on different phases. And different phases, therefore, will grow with different rates and different characteristic mechanisms. So here I'm gonna, I want to go back to the NACL uh, example that, that I gave at the very beginning and show three, three cases. Uh, one is the growth of a crystal. It's the same movie that I showed at the very beginning where we have a, a cubic particle that just grows as a cubic particle. And then I want to show you uh, two other movies where the same particle grows in a different environment. I'll just make them run uh, in parallel. So you see that the same particle here is growing into different shapes. Uh, however, its crystal structure is exactly the same. So what's going on? Well, what's going, what's going on here is the fact that the environment itself uh, is responsible for the growth rate. It contributes to the growth rate of specific phases. And uh, w when we add barbituric acid at high pH values, uh, to a supersaturated solution of an ACL that's growing, uh, that's, that's contributing to the growth of, of an ACL uh, particles, basically we will slow down the growth of these, uh, of, these uh, of other phases that are not the cubic ones, and therefore those phases will emerge. And the same will happen, but for a different set of phases, when we uh, use the same additive, so barbituric acid, but at a, at a low pH. So what's going on here is basically we have these, uh, these cubes uh, that evolve following two different pathways. One pathway is this one that goes from M5, morphology 5, to morphology 6. And uh, it's what happens when we add barbituric acid, which basically is slowing down the growth of these uh, blue faces and therefore uh, leads to these 
to this type of shape. And what happens instead when we have uh, uh, barbituric acid at low pH, so in acidic conditions, is that the green phases are slowed down significantly and therefore the evolution of the crystal ev uh, follows this path that goes through M3 and leads to uh, and this, this morphology called M7 that only exposes these green phases. Okay, so the key idea here, the key concept is that uh, uh, the environment uh, affects the shape of crystals and therefore affects what the surfaces are that, that those crystals expose to a solution. This is uh, true also for organic molecules. Again, very qualitatively here, I'm showing crystals of urea that are uh, have the, exactly the same uh, bulk structure, but they have different shapes. And the reason why they have different shapes is that they've been grown in different solvents. And therefore, the solvents that interact with those crystals uh, will affect the relative growth rate of different phases and therefore lead to different uh, structures. Uh, it is true also that impurities have a similar effect. So in this case, I'm showing two cases where uh, there is an impurity called biuret uh, that interacts with the surface of crystal and leads to further modifications in their, in their uh, shape. So from an engineering perspective, uh, when, we look, when we look into crystallization, we are interested in it because it, it performs, it allows to perform separations and it's very relevant because lots of, proper, uh, lots of products are actually uh, produced through a crystallization uh, process. But uh, one of the most interesting aspects is that uh, the product specification associated to a crystallization process is not just the purity. It's also related to what the crystal shape should be, what the polymorphic form should be, and what the typical size of the particles produced by a crystallization process, uh, process should be. So uh, pros and cons of, of, the, of the crystallization from an engineering perspective are that, uh, for example, it's highly selective, it's energy efficient, and it can be performed in mild conditions, so it does not require huge uh, energy input. However, it's a, it's a slow process. Uh, it requires solid liquid separation because what you produce, uh, it's a suspension of crystals in a, in a solution, for example. So you will need uh, uh, filtration processes to get rid of the solution and take away your, pro your product at the end. It's complex to control and, and uh, it's heavily reliant on this fundamental understanding of the processes. And therefore, uh, you know, the development of, of specific processes uh, is associated to uh, developing also fundamental understanding of the crystallization of specific systems. Uh, typical design questions that engineers uh, have, to, have to answer are related to, for example, what is the type of operation that uh, they want to run? They want to run a batch process or a continuous process. Uh, what is the scale of the process they're interested in? Uh, what is the solvent they have to choose? At what temperature they want to run a crystallization process? At what supersaturation? All these aspects will have an impact on the kinetics of nucleation, of growth, and essentially on the product that they will get, because uh, the, all these variables will impact shape, polymorphic form, and so on and so forth, and size. So uh, I just want to uh, give an example of how processes can be seen in the context of these fundamentals. And uh, in particular, I want to, to relate again to the solubility diagram and to typical process configurations. So one typical process configuration for crystallization processes is a continuous process. And a continuous process will operate at a steady state uh, in a steady state at a certain concentration, which is uh, larger than equilibrium concentration. And its operation on this plane could be characterized by a single point uh, that's above the solubility curve. Uh, a batch process instead will uh, look a lot like a, a cooking experiment. Basically, you will, you will prepare a system uh, at super saturated and then will follow a trajectory where molecules move from the solution to the crystal phase and therefore uh, will produce a trajectory on this plane, uh, on the plane of, of temperature and concentration that, uh, that, is, uh, that characterizes the solubility of uh, the solubility curve. So it will follow a trajectory, a qualitative trajectory similar to the green one. Uh, if you want to perform, for example, a batch experiment and also cool while, while you perform this experiment, we will see that your system will follow a, a, a curvilinear trajectory in this space that will approach at some point uh, the solubility curve. Now, uh, this brings me to my, to my final slide. Uh, yeah, my final slide. 
which basically uh, relates to, to providing a little bit of an overview of what the role of chemical engineers is in developing crystallization uh, processes efficiently. So we've seen that crystallization is responsible for bridging this gap between the properties of molecules at the nanometric scale to the properties of material at the micro, uh, micron scale, at the macroscopic scale. Um, engineers are actually responsible to uh, be able to actually build devices that allow to gap the, to, to bridge this gap while fulfilling specific constraints on what the properties of the materials are. So basically, uh, we are responsible to design uh, routes that are uh, based on developing equipment and, de and developing processes uh, that are able actually to bridge uh, and to carry out these processes in a controlled way, in such a way that the, re the result is, is uh, uh, what, what we uh, need and what we want for applications. And uh, an important aspect of this process is that this process cannot happen in isolation. So to perform uh, uh, equipment and process design, which is something that affects, again, the scale of meters to tens of meters, so it affects equipment that, that is significantly uh, the size of your car, essentially, you need to know in detail what happens at the scale of molecules. So you need to know what the nucleation mechanisms and kinetics are, what the growth mechanisms and kinetics are, but also, for example, how crystals aggregate and break inside the, inside the vessel. And then you need to develop information about, for example, what the fluid dynamics of this equipment is and how transport phenomena behave in those type of, uh, in those type of uh, process uh, uh, units. So, the, the point I want to make here is that the engineers have, uh, can play a, vari a variety of roles in this uh, scheme. And they can either work on developing information on the fundamentals of the process or in putting them together and develop um, a process, uh, process level design. The overall goal is to be able to consistently put together all this information to target uh, desired properties in terms of size, shape, the polymorphic nature, and also the production scale, the productivity of a certain, of a certain uh, material. So this brings me to the end, and, and uh, let me recap what, what I've been discussing in this uh, uh, slightly, in this, in this half an hour uh, discussion on crystallization. So first of all, we've looked at what is crystallization, and we have highlighted the fact that uh, crystallization is this uh, process of assembly of molecules into a new phase. So it's associated with the phase transition that leads to particles with specific properties, both in terms of size, uh, shape, and, uh, and uh, their actual bulk structure. Crystals assemble uh, due to, to a thermodynamic driving force, uh, which is associated to the fact that in every solvent, uh, in every system, there is a, there is a, a thermodynamic uh, equilibrium that defines uh, uh, the equilibrium uh, solubility of a certain solute. And therefore, if we exceed that, there would be a thermodynamic driving force towards the formation of a new phase. Uh, and we've seen that that new phase can be different in structure. So the phenomenon of polymorphism is associated to the existence of multiple crystal structures uh, for every, for every uh, specific uh, uh, molecule that undergoes crystallization. We've also seen that uh, this process leads to, to particles that have a shape, and uh, those, uh, those shape emerging in particular conditions are usually called habits, and those crystal habits therefore depend on uh, uh, on the environment and on the relative growth uh, kinetics that are affected by that environment. Uh, so the role of chemical engineers to conclude in this context is to be able to put, uh, being able to put all this information together and uh, use it to our advantage to develop equipment that is not only uh, capable of carrying out these type of processes, but it's also efficient and it's able to target uh, rationally designed uh, properties. So uh, I want to leave you with this uh, recap slide that just shows the last, uh, the last discussion. And uh, I would like to point out that uh, this material that I've, that I've been covering today, it's part of two, uh, two courses that I teach within the chemical engineering curriculum. One is a second year course on particulate systems and separation processes. And another one is a master level course that's called advanced separation. And uh, um, Many of the, of the figures that you've seen, of the movies that you've seen, instead come from uh, graduate, graduate level research that comes from molecular simulations of this type of systems. So the, the research that we carry out in, in a group, in my group, is, uh, is related to 
understanding and providing information at the molecular level. So with this, I've finished. Uh, I thank you for participating and for your attention. And I would be happy to answer any, any questions or to, to review any part that, that would be of interest. Okay, I see one question that reads, regarding crystallization, how do you deal with imperfection of the crystal as due to thermodynamics condition and the crystallization, the atom lining could never be that perfect. How do you deal with defects such as point effect, line defect and shear defect? Yes, okay. So this is an interesting question. You're absolutely right. When you're looking at a, a, a real crystal, uh, crystals are never perfect. So the perfect crystal that extends with its uh, long range order to infinity and beyond, I would say, uh, it's only an ide idealization that is only true when we are doing computational, a certain type of computational experiments. Wherever we have, we have uh, a defect, uh, I mean, in, in these systems, uh, there, will be, there will be inherently defects. And defects are, will actually be very important to define the actual dynamics of, of growth, for example, of, of crystals. Uh, so if you're talking about real systems, uh, there is not much control that we can have on, on, on defects. Well, we can learn when they develop and try to reduce uh, the development of, of defects if that's what we want. Uh, but uh, the point is the formation of defects will be inherently associated to uh, the physical chemical nature of, of the substance that's growing. Uh, so, for example, uh, the growth at the interface, if I go back to, let me see if I can go back to uh, the example. So this one on, on, uh, on, growth, uh, on growth mechanisms. Uh, so growth actually happens at defects. So they, they are essential to, to understand. Uh, understanding defects is essential to understand how real crystals evolve. I hope I've answered your question. If you if you uh, want to follow up, please uh, please uh, use your Q and A. Uh, so, the following question is: uh, What will be the efficiency in crystallization process? What number do you consider is a good number to state crystallization was successful? Okay, that's a broad question, right? Because uh, efficiency can be seen in different ways. Uh, let me see. Let me see this this slide here. So. We are targeting a, you know, with a crystallization process, you are usually targeting the production of particles that have to obey some sort of constraint in terms of size, of shape, of polymorphic structure, and also of scale. So efficiency uh, will, be, will be measured in terms of being able to meet those constraints and uh, being able to do it with the minimal expenses, with minimal expenses in terms of uh, both capital costs, so how many, uh, how many crystallizers do you need to achieve a specific goal, for example, uh, but also uh, operating costs, such as the, the energetic cost of cooling, for example. Uh, so efficiency will be, will be associated to that. Given a certain productivity, given the capability of, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, um, complying with some constraints associated to the function of the, of the product, uh, how, how much can we actually invest uh, into the process? There is another question. Uh, again, uh, please follow up if, if, I, if you think I can be more clear and, and, uh, and uh, follow up on my answer. So there's another question uh, from Narpesh uh, that, uh, that's about birth and spread mechanisms and says, birth and spread methods does really reflect mother crystal nature. So that's a good, that's a good observation. So all the mechanisms of growth that I've uh, briefly, briefly hinted about uh, are associated to, um, the, are associated to uh, the inherent uh, chemical 
uh, physical chemical features of specific surfaces. So think about uh, uh, think about uh, a parameter that could be responsible of the ease of formation of defects on that surface. If you have a, if you have a surface that is uh, very prone to form defects, that surface will be prone to expose sites that uh, that are favorable for growth very easily. And therefore, that surface is likely to grow following a rough growth diffusion limited type of mechanism. If instead that surface does not easily form those those uh, uh, defect defected sites, basically you will need the nucleation of an island uh, to 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 observe uh, a to observe a, a growth process, and and therefore birth and spread will reflect the the nature or the the existence and the observation of that of that process will reflect the nature of the crystal itself. Now think of, uh, imagine that the, the energy associated to uh, the formation of that island is so large that you never see, uh, basically the process of formation of that island is so slow that you never really see one on any surface. Well, in those cases, uh, the under-coordinated defect sites that are the hotspots for growth will actually be provided by, by, by topological defects that emerge on the surface, such as, such as spirals. So if I go back to that, uh, to that slide where the mechanisms were shown uh, here. So if we go from left to right, uh, basically we have uh, rough growth, birth and spread and spiral growth. Uh, these mechanisms will dominate respectively as uh, the uh, energy for the formation of a surface defect increases. Uh, as the energy increases, you will move towards spiral growth. As it decreases, you will move towards rough growth. Okay, there's a follow-up uh, uh, to defects. So as the atom leaves uh, uh, equilibrium position, leaves vacancies, like in a shot your Frankel, it is actually a promotion to crystal growth. Uh, yes, um, uh, as an atom leaves, uh, uh, one of these uh, of these uh, positions actually it will expose a high energy site, a site that is uh, very likely to uh, host a new molecule that comes in and therefore that will lead to growth. Uh, of course, the, the actual dynamics of growth will, will depend on the abundance of sites and on, or re, on their relative uh, concentration on surfaces. So if you have a very high concentration of uh, high energy sites, uh, you will have a rough type of mechanism. If you have an extremely low concentration of these high energy sites, you will have a, a spiral growth type of uh, mechanism. Okay, uh, thank you for your question, Arpesh. I see, I see there's another. Uh, I hope I've answered, the, uh, I've answered the questions. Let me see. Okay, I don't see any other question popping up. We still have a few minutes. So if you have any questions concerning the classes or the material or how to obtain this material online, please uh, go ahead and, and, uh, and uh, ask. Okay, I don't see I don't see any other question popping up. Um, oh, okay. Okay, the first question is uh, is uh, again. I know this may not be the right place to ask, uh, but has there been any more information on whether the lectures in September will be online or in person? So uh, you, the first part of your of your question is correct. I'm not in the position of answering this officially in this in this uh, chat. So I would I would refer you to to write uh, to the department uh, uh, through through official channels to to get uh, a complete and and uh, a complete answer on this on this question. So there's another question on the physical chemistry of these. So it says, so we know that the system's free energy is F U minus T S. Does crystal growth rely on the entropy difference? Good point. 
so this is this is a counterintuitive uh, counterintuitive uh, i mean sorry it's it's an area in which there are lots of uh, of misunderstanding but you're right uh, so the driving force that i was hinting about without without really mentioning it when i was discussing about uh, the solubility curve is uh, is free energy and uh, in particular uh, we express free energy in this context uh, as chemical potential. The chemical potential of a solution in undersaturated, so basically the chemical potential, potential difference between a solution at a certain uh, composition in undersaturated conditions and a crystal is positive, while the difference in chemical potential between the same two states, so a, a certain uh, solution at a certain composition, this time supersaturated, and a crystal uh, is is uh, negative. And so basically, in uh, uh, in a supersaturated solution area of this of this graph, uh, the chemical potential uh, is negative, which means that the free energy associated to the formation of crystals is negative, and the process is spontaneous. You're right. Uh, the free energy is associated to two contribution. One contribution is an an energetic contribution, and the other is an entropic contribution. So usually we interpret entropy as a, as disorder, as disorder. Uh, although we could think of entropy as a, the number of ways we have to arrange our system. So typically, when we have a crystallization process, uh, we uh, entropy is not is not uh, favorable in the sense that uh, the formation of a, the formation of a crystal is associated with the loss of entropy. You see that those those. Um, molecules come together and they lose uh, translational rotational freedom and they also uh, uh, of, you know they also um, uh, lock into a very specific position and if they're conformationally flexible they will lock into a sp very specific conformation so the entropic term is not favorable what is usually not favorable what is usually favorable is the enthalpic term so in this free energy in this free energy um, uh, in this free energy uh, expression. And the enthalpic term is associated to the fact that those uh, states where, where uh, translation, rotation, conformational transitions, and so on and so forth are limited, are very much energetically favorable in the sense that the molecule is able to establish interactions that are very efficient and lower a lot uh, the energy. However, it's very hard to, it's very hard to actually uh, generalize this idea because it, in the literature there are notable examples where crystallization can actually occur driven by entropy. But uh, the argument there is a little bit subtler and, uh, and is, is more subtle. And I would say in general, uh, it is the enthalpic component, the energetic component that is driving uh, the free energy. The correct way of thinking at, at this problem is not really, is, the, is the associated to thinking about uh, free energy rather than to specific components of uh, the free energy, so the enthalpic and entropic. Uh, components. I hope I answered. There is lots more that can be said about this. Uh, yeah, I hope I, I hope I answered. Um, there's another question. So thank you for the good plan. Thank you for the comment. Uh, can you refer us to online material that could help us better understand? Um, yes. Uh, so it. it uh, I have in mind several books that are that are very very relevant. There's one in particular uh, that's called Crystallization. is from John Mullin, and actually historically is is very relevant to to UCL in the sense that John Mullin has been has been a professor at UCL Chemical Engineering for a long time, and he's one of the uh, he's written this book on crystallization that is uh, one of the most important books on the subject, and it touches upon uh, several of the of the things that I discussed. So several of the um, uh, fundamentals and also goes well above and beyond in the discussion in the discussion of, of industrial crystallization. So if I had to refer to a specific book, I would, su I would suggest that. Uh, however, there's lots of other of other interesting uh, uh, resources uh, on uh, uh, resources on online more, more on qualitative uh, in qualitative terms and, and there's lots of interesting papers, but I, I don't think this is a, a, the, the right context. So concerning a book, crystallization by John Marling also historically is very relevant to, to the context of this lecture. Uh, is it possible to grow uh, quasi-crystals with a similar method with, method with actual crystalline materials? Uh, so I have to be honest here, I cannot answer your, your question. I don't know. I, I know a bit about uh, 
very qualitatively. I know, I know something about quasi crystals, uh, but they're not my, my area of, of research, of expertise, and uh, I have to refer you to, to, to the literature to somebody, somebody else. I cannot really answer your, your question. Okay. <laughs> sorry for asking so many complicated questions. No, 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 you, you shouldn't be sorry. That's kind of the purpose of these type of, of meetings. And, uh, and uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, I don't see any other question coming up. We still have five minutes. So if you're interested in what the structure of uh, uh, PSSP or the advanced separation courses are or anything else, ah, I, may, I may give you my, my contact uh, just highlight. Uh, I mean, if you have any follow-up question that pops up uh, uh, asynchronously, I should say, my, my email is, is uh, this one here. Oops, sorry, I lost that. Okay, is my is this one here in the, in the lower right corner? So I'm dot salvalaglio at ucl.ac.uk. So feel free to feel free to write questions, and I'll do my best to answer. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if this is all, I would close the session. I thank everybody for attending and for asking questions. And I uh, uh, hope to see you uh, hopefully in person at UCL uh, next year. Uh, bye.